For this video, we will cover how to complete autosomal dominant pedigrees. Let's start by talking about the items that we use to identify a pedigree as autosomal dominant. Every affected person has at least one affected parent. Most generations have affected individuals. Males and females have an equal chance of being affected. Around 50% of the individuals are affected. And two affected parents can have unaffected children. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and look at a pedigree and go through some of the basic ways to complete it. Note that this should look very similar to the recessive pedigrees that we've discussed. We're simply going to flip how we fill out the shaded and unshaded individuals. So let's start by adding in all of our known items. Since this is a dominant trait, we know that all of the unshaded individuals have to have two lowercase letters. And let's just use A's to make it easier. So let's give them all two small A's. Now each of the shaded individuals are then going to need one big A to start with. With that out of the way, we can now start asking the question, what is the second allele of all of the shaded individuals? We're basically just going to look at the parents and offspring of each individual and see if we can determine or justify what their second allele has to be. Keep in mind here that we won't be able to justify a homozygous dominant individual, or big A, big A, and as such, we may end up with some question marks. The question mark simply indicates that it could be either a dominant allele, big A, or a recessive allele, little a. Let's start with individual 1-1. This individual does not have parental information, so we look at the children instead. From this, we can determine that he has to be heterozygous, or big A, little a. This is because of individual 2-5 being homozygous recessive. This means that individual 2-5 had to have received one recessive allele from both her mom and dad. And as such, individual 1-1, or the father in this case, has to be heterozygous to be able to pass on the recessive trait. This then also justifies individual 1-2 as heterozygous due to the same reasoning. So let's move on to individual 2-2. This individual does have parental information, but since both are expressing the trait, it does not help us in figuring out the second allele. So let's look at the kids instead. All of individuals 2-2's three children are homozygous recessive. This again means that they would all have had to receive a recessive allele from both their mom and dad. As such, individual 2-2, or the father in this case, would have to be heterozygous to be able to express a trait and still be able to pass on the recessive allele. Now let's see what individual 2-3 is going to be like. Again, we have parental information that will not be helpful. But this individual does have a child that is homozygous recessive. This again means that both the mom and the dad of the child would have to give one recessive allele each. And as such, both individuals 2-3 and 2-4, the father and mother respectively, would have to be both heterozygous for the child becoming homozygous recessive. On to individual 2-7. Here we have no parental information, so let's look at the kids. We again have a child that is homozygous recessive. And again, this child would have to have received a recessive allele from both parents. As such, individual 2-7, the mother in this case, would have to be heterozygous in order to be able to donate the recessive allele while also displaying the trait. That gets us into the third generation. Let's start with individual 3-4. Here we have parental information, but no offspring information. Since both parents are heterozygous, we cannot truly justify a second allele for individual 3-4. The reason here is that we know that individual 3-4 has at least one big A. If he received that from dad, then mom would have a 50% chance of giving either a big A or a small A. Similarly, if mom donated the big A, then dad would have a 50% chance of giving either a big A or a small A. As such, we cannot truly justify the second allele, and individual 3-4 will have to be a big A question mark. Lastly, we have individuals 3-6 and 3-7. These are both going to be heterozygous due to the same justification. If we look at the parents, we know that they received their dominant allele from mom. However, dad can give only recessive alleles. As such, both would have to have at least one recessive allele, and they are then both heterozygous. Keeping these simple rules in mind should make you able to complete autosomal dominant pedigrees without too much trouble. 
Always start by confirming that the pedigree is in fact autosomal dominant. Then add your knowns to complete as much of the pedigree as possible. And then just ask the question, what is the second allele of all the shaded individuals? This concludes a video covering how to complete autosomal dominant pedigrees.